Let us pray. Heavenly Father, just like you did on the first Pentecost Sunday, send us your Holy Spirit that we might have new insight, true understanding, that we might come to know you better and understand the power, the grace, and the glory that you are and that you created in this world. It goes without saying that every time you read the Bible, especially through the Bible, new things seem to pop up that you had never noticed before. Um, I've probably started that uh, sermons like that probably at least three or four times this year as we've gone through the Bible. This time for me, at least in this section of the Bible, the thing that has popped out the most is the, is the relationship between the character Joab and David. Um, Joab has become a popular name for parents to name their sons in the last few years. Um, and why not? Joab is a military hero. He's a warrior for God. He is David's right-hand man. He's actually the David for David. If David is like Saul in that he is the new king, that he has been crowned king, Joab is to David as David was to Saul. If you think about that, the parallels are striking. He is the leader of the army. He is, David, uh, he is David's trusted soldier. He gets things done for David. Actually, the thing I've noticed this time is that Joab seems to do the dirty work that David just isn't really comfortable doing as king. David's in a precarious position as king. We need to remember that. Because all of the family of Saul still lives when David takes the throne. All those who were loyal to Saul are still alive. Because David doesn't truly oppose Saul in the traditional replacing a king with another king. He doesn't take the kingdom from him. Saul and Jonathan just die. David just ascends to the throne. There's really no coup d'etat. There's no sweeping in of the palace and beheading the former king. It doesn't happen that way. David simply delivers the victory against the Philistines that they've been fighting for for so long, and he becomes the leader. He comes dancing into Jerusalem in front of the ark. But many oppose David. We don't necessarily notice that in a broad scope look at King David and his reign, but if you read it the way we've been reading it, you see that many do oppose David. And David wants to offer them, those who oppose him, he wants to offer them a peaceful transition to his power and his reign. He doesn't want to just kill them all. <laughs> right? He wants to pardon them. He wants to work with them. He wants to get them on his side. He wants to use them. Joab, as we see, does that dirty work. Removing those who would oppose David from the scene. If it was the mafia, you'd consider Joab the button pusher. If a button needs push, he's going to push it. If it was politics, he'd be the ruthless chief of staff who works behind the scenes and gets things done no matter how it takes. He's willing to do the nasty things behind the scenes to get the job done. Anybody watch Yellowstone out there? Joab is ripped. Right? There's no question. Joab is ripped. He's the man behind the man who gets things done. And if you know who Rip is, you know who Joab is, enough said. He can tame back. Joab does the practical thing so much in the Bible that as I was reading it, I even began to wonder 
If there was actually two Davids, the public passive David, who's saying all the right things in public, the compassionate David, the David who wants to pardon everybody and make peace with everybody. But then there's also this practical David behind the scenes who goes and makes this flowery speech and then Joe goes to Joab and says, hey, Joe, It's almost like that because Joab does the practical things every time that David doesn't, at least publicly, doesn't want to do. But he benefits from what Joab does. You see what I mean about Joab being David's David? Because that's what David was for Saul. And if we know anything about what David was for Saul, we might think, hmm, there's going to be a power struggle between David and Joab. Lurking behind the scenes again. Joab is there with David through everything that happens, though, too. He plays a role in the whole Bathsheba thing. He's the one that comes back to David with the message saying out loud directly to David's face, you know that Uriah the Hittite died. <laughs> he wouldn't need to give him that message unless he knew what that message really meant. So, that Joab has got some dirt on David. That's an interesting power to have over the king, to know the king's dirty laundry. We see Joab, though, remaining loyal to David during the Absalom rebellion that happens after the Bathsheba thing. And it's, it's the end of that, that, that the rebellion has been put down, it's the end of that that is our reading for today. David has been victorious, defeating Absalom. And we have to remember that David had to flee from Jerusalem. He, had to, he was outside of the kingdom. It was a pretty bleak time for David. But now David is victorious, defeating Absalom. In fact, Absalom is dead. And despite that great victory, David is consumed with grief. Why? Because Absalom was his son. Absalom is his son. And you can say, well, David's got lots of children. Lots of wives, lots of children. But he's saddened. His heart is torn. On one hand, he's glad to be alive. Glad to be restored to the throne. Glad to be returning back to Jerusalem. To resume his reign. But he's got a divided heart. Because it is his son, and he is sad at his son's passing. All of the hopes, all of the dreams, all of the potential that he thought, that he knew his son was going to achieve, is over at this moment. And let's, let's look at the text that Charlotte read, because it's really powerful. Joab was told, it starts. Joab was told. Very passive. The king is weeping and mourning for Absalom, and for the whole army, the victory that day was turned into mourning. Imagine that. Look at the connection here between the king and the army, and their mood, and their, their connection. It's, the, it's this connection. When he's happy, they're happy. When he weeps, they mourn. He's mourning, they're mourning with him. The whole army, the victory that day was turned into mourning. Not a celebration, but sad. Regret. Because on that day, the troops heard it said, the king is grieving for his son. Just because they heard that, they themselves grieve. They get it. They understand. They feel for their king as a man, as a human, as a father. Look at what they do. The men stole into the city that day as men steal in who are ashamed when they flee from battle. 
These are the victorious soldiers. Given a mission. Completed the mission. But they had to sneak into Jerusalem as if they had lost. Or not even as if they had lost. As if they had fleed from the battle itself. As if they had turned coward and ran. As if they had somehow disgraced their king. They are victorious, but they feel real shame. Because David is mourning. The king covered his face and cries aloud, O oh, my son, O oh, Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. It's a sweet moment of the connection between soldiers and their king. The emotional connection that they have to each other. And I like this line because it gives a title to one of my favorite books of all time, William Faulkner's O Absalom, O Absalom. But Joab doesn't see it that way. Right? Joab is being told this. Everything I just read is Joab being told what's going on. Check it out. Your soldiers are sad. David's sad. Everything's sad. Everything that you've just worked for, the victorious battle that you have, is turned into this place. So this is what Joab does. Then Joab went to the house to the king and said, notice it doesn't say went to Jerusalem, because they're not in Jerusalem yet. The battle is won, but the entrance has not taken place. Today, you have humiliated all your men who have just saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters and the lives of your wives and concubines. You love those who hate you, and you hate those who love you. You have made it clear today that the commanders and their men mean nothing to you. I see that you would be pleased if Absalom were alive today and all of us were dead. Now go out and encourage your men. I swear by the Lord that if you don't go out, not a man will be left with you by nightfall. This will be worse for you than all the calamities that have come on you from your youth until now. It's quite a threat. And remember who this threat is coming from. David's David. Saul is to David as, Abs or as David is to Joab. What would it mean for Joab to make this threat? None of your men will be with you by nightfall. Why? Because they will be with me. If you don't get yourself straight, you're going to lose everything I have, you have. And that means I gave it to you. I gave you this. Your men gave you this. And if you don't want it, we'll take it another way. Joab isn't having any of David's tears and his sadness. He points it straight up. Why would you cry for this son of yours when he rebelled against you and would have killed you and the rest of your family? Get some perspective on this, man. It reminds me of, of Friar Lawrence and Romeo and Juliet. If, you know, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. But this is a great speech that he gives, right? The second half of Romeo and Juliet is a bunch of crying. It's obnoxious. You just want to punch him in the face. It's just it's like, stop the crying. And Friar Lawrence does that. He says that to Romeo. He's like, dude, everything you've done doing is wrong. He says this. Rouse thee, man, your Juliet is alive. For those whose dear sake you would but lately be dead. For that you should be happy. Tybalt would have killed you, but you slayed him. That should make you happy as well. The law said it threatened death to you, but it turned death into banishment instead of death. There you should be happy. You don't even realize all of these things that have happened to you 
were bad are actually for your own good. That's exactly what Joab is saying to David. You don't even know how good you have it, David. And it's just been given to you. It's all dependent upon the men who gave their lives to give it to you. To win, to be victorious, to return you through the throne. That's what these men died to give to you. And you're going to cry about it. You're going to shame their memory with your unhappiness. You can understand where Joab is coming from. And it's Memorial Day. Who doesn't have these thoughts on Memorial Day? How, like, I went and searched the internet, and maybe artificial intelligence could have found it, but I searched the old way. Does anybody use this passage to preach on Memorial Day? The answer was no, and I'm like, what? Why? Maybe it's because people don't read about Joab. We just skip over that part. But man, this is the Memorial Day message. The day that we remember what those who have come before us and have given their lives for us, for others, for their country. Joab wouldn't like us to dishonor that sacrifice either. Have you seen that commercial? Um, it's of a World War II veteran is speaking in the and and D-Day stuff is happening and it's all this stuff going on and he's speaking about the loss of his brothers in arms at Normandy and other places and freedom and what it costs. And he speaks about the sadness he feels when he sees what the American people. The Joab message. You turned away from what you knew was so important that these people believed in and gave their lives for. It makes me think, what do we do on Memorial Day to owe? What do we owe to the memory of those who have fallen? You see in the bulletin two of the most famous statements on the idea other than Joab. One is the poem in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place, and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Fields. <clears throat> so this is the message of the dead fallen soldier. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders, Flanders fields. We pass the torch on to you to carry it and continue the fight, and if you don't, we will not be able to sleep and lie to our rest. Despite the fact that we're surrounded by poppies that would allow us to sleep, cause us to sleep. The fact, the fact that we are dead speaks to what we owe to the soldiers. The other is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. You all heard the four score and seven years ago, but this is the end. In a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggle here have consecrated it far <coughs> above our poor power to add unto the trap. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave their last full me measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead men shall not have died in vain. 
That seems to be all that Joab wants from David. He doesn't want the king to be feeling sad about the victory he's been given. How much is America's issue, the United States' issue, with the guilt they feel about having won the Cold War, about being a superpower in the world? What does that say to those who have fallen to get us to this point? Dying in vain is that what Joab is telling David. Do not let these men who have died for you die in vain. It's interesting to me that Memorial Day often coincides with Pentecost. The day of the Spirit, the birthday of the church, the tie that binds us together. How are we bound to those who have given their lives for us? How does the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the indwelling insight that it gives, the indwelling peace, indwelling truth, how does that bridge and heal the divided heart? Is David's heart divided? His own personal loss, his own feelings of sadness. And the guilt he feels at being victorious when his son has fallen. I'm not sure that Joab's right in a lot of what Joab does. But he cuts to the chase here. He cuts right through it all. And he gives a message that we should hear and that we should heal. We just zoom out a little bit of our own personal struggles. And see the sacrifices that have been made to give us the life that allows us to struggle with such things. Joab gives to David that perspective on this day, and it reaches through the ages and touches us right where it should, right in the heart. And hopefully it meets the Holy Spirit there. And that puts the truth into the right kind of perspective. It heals us and gives us focus to think not of ourselves, but of our connection to others, those who have sacrificed, and beckons for us to pick up the torch, carry it, and to fight the good fight for the truth. Heavenly Father, when you send your Holy Spirit, not only does it sustain us and lift us up and connect us to each other, but it also makes us look at ourselves and look at how we have fallen, looking at how much we need Christ, how much we need the sacrifice and the love of Jesus Christ, how it holds us together.